Glad you can join us again in our study of the book of Isaiah. I'll ask if you will please to be turning to chapter 8 as we're going to move into another dark chapter. Uh, as I was telling the students uh, at school this week, Isaiah is a difficult study because it's, it's peaks and valleys. Uh, you, you've got warnings, you've got threats, and then through all of this, you have references about the remnant. You've got messianic prophecies, and all those are shown uh, to be just a, it's, it's the moods are, are just up and down. Our emotions run, run high and low as it relates to that. And it's largely because, again, of the context that we see uh, as to what Judah has done. Isaiah has a very difficult message. It was difficult for these prophets as we realize what it was that they had to face. It's hard to tell your countrymen that the country's going to go down. That message was delivered to Israel, uh, and they were going to go down in Isaiah's lifetime. It was only going to be about 20 years after Isaiah wrote this book or, 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 or uh, uttered these prophecies that Israel was going to fall to Assyria. Well, Assyria is still a big player here, and that's because it's still in that heyday. Assyria is at their peak historically uh, at this point. It's going to culminate though, in about another hundred years or so, where we're going to see uh, Babylon take Assyria, and having taken Assyria, they're the world power. They're going to come. They're going to come and, and going to come and punish Judah. But Judah is going to suffer before Babylonian captivity, and it's going to be because of some mistakes that Ahaz made. We've mentioned these, but I want to hit the high spots again. Uh, as it relates to what's going on behind the scenes here so we can better understand what's happening. Remember again the syro ephraimitic War. I know that I've mentioned that several times, but it's something we have to understand because it's so key to the context of these chapters. And that was an opportunity. You're looking at Tiglath-Pileser III was a general of Assyria who had risen to power. And as he rose to power, he immediately began to try to expand the borders of the kingdom. He became very aggressive in his dealings with others. And so Israel and Assyria both attempted, or they both formed an alliance to try to stand against Assyria. And then as it relates to Isaiah's message, Ahaz was involved. He was the king of Israel. At the at king of Judah, excuse me, at the time of that conflict. And he was being pressured by Israel and Syria, Samaria and Damascus, to form an alliance with them to help stem that Assyrian tide. He refused to do so, to his credit. But then at the same time, he decided that he was going to form an alliance, if you will, with Assyria. He was going to submit himself to them, and he was going to subject himself to heavy tribute in order to do that. When you look at chapter 7, again, we just looked at that prophecy of Emmanuel. Remember, chapter 7 through chapter 12 is now going to be seen as the book of Emmanuel. We're going to see that name come up numerous times. Uh, and so he was asked for a sign, and the sign that he was given by God when he chose not to give a sign was that Emmanuel was going to be born. A virgin should conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. That Emmanuel is going to be a key figure. But it's something, as we said last week, if you'll remember, that, I, that Ahaz should have remembered. He was in the house of David. Promises had been made to David that God was going to keep his line pure. Going all the way back to Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. And then you find that promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that God was going to keep the line pure. Ahaz, in that line, should have known those prophecies and should have been comforted in those promises. But he was not. When things began to heat up, he sought for a human response to the situation and what he thought was a human cure to preserve the kingdom. 
And that was with that submission to Tiglath-Pileser. Well, we're going to continue a message here in chapter 8 that we're going to see an attack on Emmanuel's land. Now, something else that I want you to remember, Isaiah had two sons. One is going to be referenced here, Mayor Shalom Hashbaz, and the other is Shear Jassup. The name Mayor Shalom Hashbaz is a combination of two names, Mayor Shalal and Hashbaz are in essence saying the same thing. It's something like speedy to spoil or quick to plunder. Uh, and so it's a message that's always given as it relates to Isaiah in the context of what's going to happen to Israel and Syria. And then the name Sheer Jashub means the remnant shall return. And that's used in very much of a positive concept, what should be a comforting, calming con context as it relates to even through all of these dark times, even through the difficulty that is seen in this time in their lives, God is not going to forget his promises. Bear all of that in mind now as we move through the text. Let's look at the present crisis in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 8. Moreover, the Lord said to me, Take a large scroll and write on it with a man's pen concerning Mayor Shalom Hashbaz. And I will take from myself faithful witnesses to record, Uriah the priest and Zechariah the son of Jeberachiah. Then I went to the prophetess, and she conceived and bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, Call his name Mayor Shalom Hashbaz. For behold, the child shall have knowledge to cry, My mother and my father and my mother. The riches of Damascus and the spoil of Samaria will be taken away before the king of Assyria. When we move into chapters 13 through 23, it's, it, it's a passage referred to as, as the table of nations. But it's a burden against all of those people that are around Judah at this time. And as the message is going to continue regarding Ahaz, what Ahaz and what Isaiah, what Ahaz needs to hear and what Isaiah was going to tell him was showing the folly of all attempted alliances with those around because every one of them are going to go down. Assyria is going to be the world power. And then they're going to fall, and Babylon is going to take over. And so we're, we're, we're seeing about conflict. We're seeing judgment. God is going to use one nation after another. He's going to punish Israel with Assyria. He's going to punish Judah with Babylon. He's going to punish Assyria with Babylon. He's going to punish Babylon with Medo-Persia. And likewise, right on down to Alexander the Great and then into Rome. We're seeing God using these nations and using the decisions of these rulers to carry out his will regarding judgment that is going to come on these nations, many of which were pagan in their religion. Well, God was revealing here the horrible consequences, revealing it to Isaiah, the horrible consequences of the decision that Ahaz made to attempt to form some kind of an alliance with Assyria. It's not going to be good. Because let's look and see again what's going to happen there. When you're looking at the kind of treaty or tribute that is determined here, you've got Assyria being the world power, and they call all the shots. They're sovereign as it relates to how things are seen on, on a natural level. Now, yes, we know God is sovereign. We know they're eventually going to have to answer to God. But as it relates to people, as it relates to interaction among humans, Assyria is in control, and Assyria makes all the rules and calls all the shots. So Ahaz was going to submit himself to, uh, to, to Assyria. He was going to pay a heavy tribute. It was a, a tribute, a tax that was established by Assyria. For a while, it worked out for his benefit because Assyria came against those people, especially Israel and Damascus, that were pressuring Ahaz to come into that alliance with them. But later on, Assyria is going to turn on them too. 
Let's not make the, mis the mistake of putting too much trust in a pagan king. There's an application that I can make here as it relates to our time today. I hear a lot of things today where people are trying to say that our president is a savior. He's, we need him to lead us back to God uh, and these things. That's not his task. He has a role in government. And we are to respond favorably to that role in government, Romans chapter 13. And other passages bring that out. But at the same time, he is not my spiritual leader. The elders in this congregation serve as the spiritual leader for those in these congregations. They have the task of feeding the flock. We need to understand that Isaiah had somebody higher to answer to. He was in that line of David. He was in that succession. He was therefore a part of the puzzle that God used to bring the Messiah. He worked through that line as he promised David that he would. But Isaiah, excuse me, Ahaz was not thinking spiritually. He was thinking from a purely specular perspective, and all he was trying to do was to save himself and his people. But he didn't have faith which was what Isaiah was trying to call for him to do. I use this passage often. I've quoted it often in Bible class. Many of you can probably quote it with me. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 37. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who stones the prophets and kills those who were sent to her. How often I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wing, but you were not willing. One prophet after another, we're going to see Isaiah providing his message. Jeremiah is going to provide his message from captivity. Daniel and Ezekiel are going to continue delivering God's message. And, and one after another, these men sought to bring God's people back to a sense of faithfulness. But they wouldn't do so. Jeremiah was one who prophesied for some 40 years. And, and as we say among preachers, he was a preacher who preached for 40 years without one positive response to his message. Why? Because God is dealing with a hard-headed, stiff-necked people. And that's the language he uses often in the book of Isaiah to describe what it is and, and why these men didn't have more success. It wasn't the fault of the message. It wasn't God's fault. It wasn't Isaiah's fault. Remember back into chapter 5 again. You're looking there at that parable, that song of the vineyard. And the point was made with the, that the whole vineyard was prepared in such a way that it should have brought a bountiful harvest. The, the owner of the vineyard could not have done one more thing to make it a better harvest. And yet, when the grapes came in, they were sour, and therefore it was seen to be destructed. That is exactly the message that's coming here. God had done everything to make it where Judah could maintain faithfulness in their lives, and the harvest was not what God had intended. And so therefore, punishment Gloom, doom, destruction are all words that describe what happened in a self-afflicted situation where these people continued to reject God's prophet, and so therefore they continued to reject God's will. And it's a point that we're going to see again here in chapter 8 as we move along. So there's a message that's prepared on this large scroll, very flowery, figurative type language that is portrayed to show a message that God delivered. The words to be written on it are translated, swift is the booty, speedy is the prey. And that's the play on words with the name of Isaiah's son, Mayor Shalal Hashbaz, that is seen. Well, two witnesses are addressed there, and interestingly, the law of Moses required two witnesses for testimony to establish truth in serious matters. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, cross-reference that with Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 28. 
Jesus quoted this very passage in the context of Matthew chapter 18. A passage that is often abused is the end of that. Look at verses 16 through 20 of Matthew 18. And the context there involves discipline and Christ being with them during that time. But witnesses were seen in that very context as well. Uriah the priest was selected because, to be one of the witnesses, not because of faithfulness, but because of his position as priest. The only, rec the only other record we have of him concerns his erecting an altar in Damascus, 2 Kings chapter 16 and verses 10 through 16. The other witness was Zechariah, and we don't know which one he is. He's otherwise unknown, unknown, excuse me, unless he's the one who taught Isaiah to seek the Lord. 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 5. Well, he then turns to the prophetess, and the prophetess was his wife in the context. And whether or not she actually prophesied is unknown. But that is the way she's addressed here uh, in the text. And so Isaiah's second son, Mayor Shalohashbaz, received the name that God commanded to be written on that scroll or on that banner. Well, God explained the meaning of the words and the name given to Isaiah's son. And what he's talking about in the context is what's going to happen to Israel, Samaria, and Syria, Damascus. Almost lost my place in my, in, in, in my thinking there. 733 B.C., Tiglath-Pileser III of Assyria deported the people of Israel. It's only going to be about another 13 years before they're finished off. And they're eventually going to be fully carried away into Assyrian captivity. Damascus was likewise besieged and it was plundered in 732 BC in fulfillment of the prophecy that is seen. Should have been an encouraging message for Ahaz, should it not? These were the two nations, the kings, who because he would not join the alliance, he was going to be taken out of the way. And Tabal, that puppet king, was going to be put in this place. And if that had occurred, the line of David would have been broken. The purity of the line through which Christ was to come would have been tainted. That did not occur. Ahaz should have been comforted, should have been emboldened by these things. But that's not the case. Now let's move to verses 5 through 10 and look at a coming crisis. The Lord also spoke to me again, saying, Inasmuch as these people refuse the waters of Shiloh that flow softly, and rejoice in reason and in Remaliah's son, now therefore, behold, the Lord brings up over them the waters of the river, strong and mighty. The king of Assyria and all his glory, he will go up over all his channels and go over all his banks. He will pass through Judah he will overflow and pass over. He will reach up to the neck, and the stretching out of his wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Be shattered, O you peoples, and be broken in pieces. Give ear, all you from far countries. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Gird yourselves, but be broken in pieces. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak the word but it will not stand, for God is with us. Okay, moving along through this section. The waters of Shiloh provided Jerusalem's main water supply. The Gihon Spring from just outside was brought inward, and there was a conduit or a pool in the city. Remember earlier, they met with Ahaz there. He was probably looking at his water supply and checking it in preparation for the assault that he thought was coming. And so water was something that was key to them 
if you're going to be safe, you've got these large, you've got the walls around the city, you've got gates that are fortified, you've got water coming in, you should have food supplies stored up, and so you're ready for any kind of attack. It's not going to be the case here. It's not going to work here. And he's even going to bring the Euphrates into mind, and he's going to use what was probably a very natural occurrence a flood and the Euphrates coming up out of its banks to describe how Tiglath Pileser III is going to come through. He's going to overflow. He's going to flood. He's going to destroy everything in his path. The word O Emmanuel, the phrase O Emmanuel in verse 8, points to the fact, however, that devastation would not be complete. So let's remember the Emmanuel that was described to us in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 and 15, that context. It was fulfilled, you might remember as we saw last week, in Matthew chapter 1 verse 23. Virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. That was very clearly messianic in its nature. And so here Emmanuel is referenced again here. Because you see, Jerusalem is still going to be a very central place, and many key things are going to occur there. Let's go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. The word of the Lord was going to proceed from Jerusalem, and all nations would be drawn to it. That was fulfilled in Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, and Peter's first sermon. The gospel was to begin in Jerusalem, and it was of such a nature that Jew and Gentile alike would come together. Now, let's rewind all the way back to Genesis chapter 12, and remember the promise to Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. I think we need to tie all these thoughts together as we're moving through, and we're seeing God's plan to redeem man unfold throughout all of these generations. At times it met a wall, but then it was resolved. You see the remnant? If, if, if Judah had been taken into captivity and that's where the story ended, then God's plan would have ended, but the remnant's going to come back. And Isaiah mentions that remnant numerous times. I'll also go ahead to the book of Esther. We've mentioned this before, but this is a time to mention it again. If Haman had had his way, all the Jews would have been exterminated. However, I believe providentially, Esther was made queen. She exposed the plot of Haman, and the line of the Jews again was not broken. The line through which Messiah would come is still sure, and it's still pure, until Genesis 49.10 is fulfilled in Christ's birth, and him being declared to be that king of the tribe of Judah. Verses 9 and 10, kings and kingdoms came against God's people, but those kings and kingdoms would not stand. If you're making notes, you might jot down Psalm 2, verses 1 through 6 here, and you'll see a very similar type message being portrayed there. God used these kings. He allowed them to have their way for a time but would ultimately protect his people and he would fulfill his promises to them. Powerful messages of hope that ring throughout this. Now, just a preview. Lord willing, next week, we're going to be looking at chapter nine and we're going to see that great prophecy of the king who's going to come and the government would be upon his shoulders. Another high point. We had a high point there in chapter seven about Messiah coming. And now we've got another low here in chapter 8. We're going to go to another high in chapter 10. Excuse me, chapter 9. We're going to see another high in chapter 11. As even through all of the harsh language and the difficult situations that are presented in these pages historically, the positive message is Messiah is coming. A message that was seen throughout. And again, remember, when the remnant came back into the land, idolatry was not a problem again. Haggai 
Zechariah, Malachi, those post-exilic prophets all brought that focus again to Messiah is coming. 425 BC, Malachi closed his prophecy with the fact that Messiah was coming and one like Elijah would prepare the way for him. In some 400 and some odd years, that was going to be fulfilled. First of all, in the, per in the person of John the Baptist, who was seen as Elijah, and then Christ being declared to be that Messiah. Well, let's look at a crisis again in chapter uh, verses 11 through 22 and close out this chapter. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk in the way of his people, saying, Do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hallow. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. He will be as a sanctuary, but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel as a trap and a snare, a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And among them, shall, and many among them shall stumble, they shall fall and be broken, be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. And I will wait on the Lord who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for signs and wonders in Israel from the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry, and it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth and see trouble and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they shall be driven into darkness. Oh, so much that can be said here. We've got a couple of minutes. So let's kind of tie this all together. Ahaz should not have looked north. Ahaz should have looked up as it related to how he was going to be delivered from the crisis in which he found, found himself. You're looking at people here. Some were going to seek wizards. Some were going to seek others. Uh, even, even the sense of talking to the dead, maybe seances could be addressed. And here you have a God who reveals himself to man, but these people are still looking for human solutions to their problem. And they don't want to hear what God has to say. And not wanting to hear what God has to say is going to result, number one, in their looking in the wrong direction for answers. And number two, they're bringing judgment upon themselves because they are rejecting the sovereignty of God. And that's a picture that is drawn here that is so powerful. Look to God. Ahaz did what he did out of fear. Many of these people are doing what they're doing out of fear, seeking out those that he's talking about here. And Isaiah says, don't fear like those people fear. Those people are fearful of the circumstances and of the situation. They're fearful of human pagan kings and their armies. And I can understand that because they were powerful. Tiglath-Pileser III had major tools in his belt. And he was able to take all of these people out as he manifested that in history. But God is the one to fear. But God is not to be feared in a sense of cringing in horror. I do not serve a God that is looking down on me, ready to pounce on me the first time that I mess up. I have a God who wants me in heaven so strongly that he sent his only son that I could have the opportunity for that. That's the God that Isaiah is told to seek here. Fear God. Have an all for him. Have a respect for him. Don't do like the people are doing. Let's remember how tough this must have been 
for these prophets, for the messages that they delivered, and for the fact that so many were killed because the people really didn't want to hear that message. We're going to close here. Let's look at verse 20 one more time. To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah was God's messenger. He was not delivering his word. And he told these people that over and over and over again. He was God's messenger. He was declaring God's will. He was declaring what God said would happen. And he also declared what God wanted to happen. And that was for the people to repent. Oh, that more would come to him. Oh, that more would see him for what he is. Be filled with awe. Be filled with reverence. And walk this life with confidence. Not because of who we are but because of whose we are. Thank you again for joining us. I hope that you'll come back next week. I hope that you're benefiting from these lessons. I hope that you're jotting down some of these passages and you'll follow through uh, with some of those to see the application. But until next week, God bless you.